Hello, everyone. This is Dory Clark, and we're here with our weekly Newsweek interview show, Better. Today's guest is Christy Hunter R. Scott. She is the author of a new book. It's called Begin Boldly. We're going to talk about how to do just that. In general, we're going to be talking about how to embrace uncertainty and build a brilliant career for yourself. Christy, welcome. Thanks so much, Dory. It is truly an honor to be here today. Well, congratulations on your new book, and it's great to have you here. And for all of you tuning in from around the world, feel free to type into the chat box and let us know who you are and where you are dialing in from. Um, Christy always always wins because uh, she's in Bermuda. <laughs> <laughs> wow. but, Good memory, Dory. Sometimes people are like Bahamas, Barbados. I'm like, I know, but it's Bermuda, so. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So it's uh, it's good, but you know, we'll, we'll we'll see. Type it in the chat box. We'll see if you can compete with Bermuda. <laughs> but in the meantime, Christy, I the book is called Begin Boldly. Let's talk about how to do that. What it when you think about how someone in all of this uncertainty, all this Michigas can actually start to take control of their career, can you know, perhaps take some strategic risks to be bold. What, what does that look like? What, what should people even begin to start thinking about if they're like, eh, begin boldly sounds good, but I don't know, where do I begin? There are so many places to begin, but um, I, I just want to share one concept that has really helped me, irrespective of what uncertainty I'm dealing with or what the context is, Dory, and it's really to choose courage over confidence. And one thing I shared in my book was that there's been so much focus on confidence to date, like cultivating confidence. How do you feel confident before you take on a risk or a bold move? And I actually think that holds us back from making the moves that will build like the most brilliant and, uh, and amazing careers and lives. And so what I share is instead of trying to focus on confidence, which I think holds us back. And again, I would have never been on this show or written a book or anything if I waited to feel confident. But I chose courage in the absence of confidence. And because of that, then confidence is the byproduct or output. But just that simple flip the script, it sounds simple. It can sound trite, but I promise you it can change lives. Every single day, I don't say I'm waking up confidently every day. I, I can't. No one does. Some of the best leaders in the world talk about facing self-doubt and fear every day. So confidence is not the prerequisite to success, but courage is. And so for me, that's one of the things that like people can start with right now in terms of that mindset shift. I love that. That's great. I'm Dory Clark. This is Newsweek's weekly interview show, Better. And we're here with Christy Hunter R. Scott. She's the author of a new book. It is called Begin Boldly. And we want to say hi to some of the great friends tuning in from around the world to join us. We've got um, Meta Sabia joining us. We've got Gokhan. We've got Mama from North Carolina. That would be my mama. Uh, she, she goes by a different name to different people. Uh, we've got uh, Bill also from North Carolina. We've got uh, April in Missouri. Farhad is here. We've got Stacy in Queens. Chandan is joining us. Jess is from Philadelphia. Gigi's in London. Harry's in Sweden. We love having all of you and type wow. your questions for Christy Hunter R. Scott into the chat box. <laughs> Dory, I want to know how's your mom's bartending course going? Oh, Mama has gone really viral, I have to say, with, with the bartending. Yes, she's taking her exam on Saturday. So send good vibes her way. She 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 needs them for uh for figuring out how to do the uh, the Tom Collins and, and all of its friends. <laughs> so thank you for asking. But what I want to ask you, Christy, and again, please feel free to type your questions for Christy into the chat box. You talk in your book, Begin Boldly, about agile experimentation. What does this mean and how can we do it? Yep, great question. So one thing, Tori, I love the way you go straight for the jugular. Like, how do we do it? And that's one thing that I talk about in my book is, so many books are inspiring, but not actionable. And so how do you do it is like the exact reason I wrote this book. Um, so agile experimentation, what I share is that sometimes we see a big change and it is daunting. It is like, do I change careers or move countries? And we, 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 we get overwhelmed. We get stuck in analysis paralysis. As I say, we're paralyzed by analysis. And analysis has some worth, but it has its limits. And you've probably heard this, Dory, from Herminia Ibarra, too. Like, she encourages us to 
um, act, then analyze, instead of analyze, then act. And that's really some of the formation of agile experimentation. And the idea is if you're seeing a big risk and you're scared, you're feel fearful, you feel like all of the nerves coming, think about how can I start a small scale experiment to actually try something and tweak it before I take that next bold move. Um, it's also a great role in persuasion. So um, in an organization, if you're negotiating for, let's say, flexibility or a different kind of work arrangement, if you go and I say, I want you to change your entire flexibility policy, Dory, the chances are it'll be a no. But if you say, what if I try this experiment? This is my goal. This is my idea of how I'll try it. Let's try it for a month. Let's measure the metrics that matter on the back end. Am I still working well? Are my results great? Are my teams happy? And that works so well also at home. So if you tell your partner, I want you to do all the pickups or all the cooking or all that it's unlikely to work, but saying, let's try this for a month, see how we do. So the idea is really to take a process and just like an experimental mentality and approach and mindset to everything we do in life, because everything we can try and tweak and improve. That's a great point. We're here with Christy Hunter R. Scott. If you're interested in learning more about her work, just check out her website. It is appropriately enough, ChristyHunterArscott.com. And uh, you can check it out there. The new book is Begin Boldly. And if you're enjoying this conversation, hit the like button and the share button so that your friends can benefit from it as well. So Christy, something that I'm curious about, a lot of times folks who are mid-career or later in their career might be a little hesitant to make changes or take uh, actual or even perceived risks. They might say, okay, be, you know, begin boldly. That's good for people at the beginning of their career, but maybe not me. Uh, I've established myself. I've, you know, I'm, I'm making a good salary. I've got a mortgage. Uh, a little harder to take risks at that point. What would you say to someone who is feeling that way? How do you think this through? I think risk is an essential point of building a bold and brilliant and rich life and existence irrespective of where you are in life. And one example is, um, oh, Dory, I'm hearing a little echo. Do you hear that? Uh, I don't personally, but I will mute myself just in case. Oh, no, I don't know. I, sometimes, you know, we were, for everyone on the line, before Dory and I got on, we were just talking about the joys of technology in a virtual environment. So, um, but I think honestly, why put a time limit on risk and begin boldly? Yes. I wanted to encourage people to take risks sooner in their careers, but ultimately it's a framework that's enduring for the rest of your life. And I present this simple framework. It's intentionally simple. So you can stick it up on your wall, remember it. And it's risk, reward, refine, repeat. And that is a lifelong process. It should never stop. You define a risk that you want to take. If you decide to take it, then on the back end, you assess the rewards and the rewards are the failures too, because you'll propel yourself further by the learnings from the failures than a consistent choice to play it safe. And then refine. Um, I always talk about the fact that when I was younger, and particularly you see this in kind of A-type females, when we get an F, as Carol Dweck said, we're more likely to say we're a failure versus a male who's more likely to say, this is data for my improvement. And I call that really identity outcome conflation, like I am a failure. And so the idea with the refine phase is, are you going to let the outcomes of risk taking refine you or define you? And the answer is refine. <laughs> and then the next phase is repeat. So I just think you do this forever in life. And that's really how these rich existences and careers are made. That's terrific. Thank you very much. We're here with Christy Hunter R. Scott. Her new book is Begin Boldly, and you can learn more at christyhunterrscott.com. We're talking career. We're talking overcoming uncertainty. Type your questions into the chat box, and we'd love to hear what's on your mind. We also want to say hi to some of our great viewers from around the world. We've got Netra joining from Nepal. We've got Shalon from Houston. Diane is in South Carolina. Doreen is back from Ohio. Kristen's in Dallas. We've got a LinkedIn friend from San Jose. Chandan's in India. Alistair's in Red Bank, New Jersey. April's in Dallas. Adila is in Dubai. Tope is in Lagos. And Eve is in Madagascar. Umesh is in India. We've got Alicia from Berkeley. Sammy's from Tunisia. And Smart Gumbo is from Nigeria. We love having every single one of you here. Thanks for joining. And a question, Christy, came in from Alistair. And Alistair wants to know, can you tell us a little bit more 
about what your first courageous uh, or risky step was personally or professionally? Is there something that, you know, sort of imprinted for you about a time early on when you took, you took those chances? Uh, hi, Alistair. He's actually a, a friend of mine. So thanks for joining on the line. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll tell you one thing that really stands out is choosing to do women's studies on the Rhodes Scholarship. And that may not seem like a big risk, but it was something that was questioned so much at the time. And there was a newspaper article that came out when I got the Rhodes Scholarship, and it said, while most Rhodes Scholars go on to do law and medicine, Christie's doing women's studies. And everyone at the time thought like, is she wasting the scholarship? What she gonna do with this? How is this gonna translate into a career? And, um, and that for me was something where I was like, I know that I am so passionate about these topics and this is really what I wanna study and do. So that for me felt risky at the time because it didn't offer as much perceived security as other routes. And the other big move was leaving my job in Deloitte Consulting um, almost nine years ago, which is crazy. And, and it was something that I was doing well at. I was well supported within the U.S. firm. I was helping to run DNI initiatives nationally, which was amazing. I had phenomenal career sponsors. But I knew in my hearts of hearts, I wanted to focus on kind of this career inclusion space exclusively. And that was a really bold move as well. So those are the two that come to mind. Those are excellent bold moves. Thank you very much. And please type your questions for Christy Hunter R. Scott into the chat box. And we want to say hi to Kin San, who's joining from Myanmar. We've got Christine from Rochester. Abdullah's in Riyadh. Camilla's in Brazil. Zeke is joining us again from San Benito, Texas. We've got Denise in Florida. We've got Chris joining here. Pauline from Santa Fe. Tanya is in Quebec. Habiba is in Casablanca. And Leslie's in Phoenix. We're glad you're all here. Now, Christy, a question... That, that I am curious about in your book. This is, this is something I actually talk about as well in my own book, The Long Game, but it's about the importance of networking. And you say that this is a critical component of beginning boldly. Obviously, this is a topic that is not always comfortable for some people. There's, there's a, a significant subset that say, eh, I, don't, I don't know how I feel about that. And perhaps after two years of the pandemic, it's accentuated even more yeah. that uh, people have, have forgotten or they've gotten a little rusty here. Why is networking so important when it comes to beginning boldly in your career development? And what, what form should it take? What do you mean by that? What should people actually be doing? Yeah, so one thing I, I truly believe is that no person is an island. And um, I don't believe in this whole narrative about people that are self-made. None of us are self-made. We exist in interconnected societies. And at some point, someone's contributed to our journey. And taking risks does not come without a chance of failure or a chance of success. And you need a support network to deal with either. If you're successful, you need someone to help you step up to the plate. When I got this book deal, I needed a whole group of people to rally around me and help me figure it out. And, and that was, those connections were so critical. Times in my career where I have failed, I also needed people to help me navigate that, analyze, think about what's next, where to learn, kind of, you know, talk me off the ledge at times when I was being too hard on myself. So your connectivity is the most essential bit other than your mindset to risking to risk taking for both of those reasons. Um, and Dory, you then said like how to start. So I think the biggest thing is start before you need it, start now. Like, and if you haven't started already, you start today following this conversation. And the tip that I give in the book, um, and this is something I've seen work so well, is when we feel nervous around networking, that is normal, okay? There, there's studies that show that people compare networking to going to the dentist. They feel dirty, self-serving, like, oh, what is this? And one way to get around those nerves is instead of focusing on what you are going to say, focus on what you're going to ask. Again, really powerful flip the script. It will change the way you network. So I don't even say the word networking because I think it elicits all that fear. I just say making connections because there are studies that have shown that people that were told to go to a cocktail party and make professional networks or just make friends, 
The ones that said made friends were more successful. So think about the language you use to talk to yourself. So I always say to my clients, what, how are you connecting with others, building relationships, right? Then the second thing is the focus on what you're going to ask, not what you're going to say. We put so much pressure on ourselves. Oh, I'm meeting Dora. I need to have all the answers. Well, what if I just have really interesting questions about your book and your career? And studies show, one, that this increases likability. It increases persuasiveness. And that actually it increases the chance of deeper connections, follow-on conversations. So it helps deal with the fears while being an effective networking tool. That's great. I just want to underline when you say, think about what you're going to ask, you mean like a question rather than a, hey, Dory, will you introduce me to Warren Buffett? <laughs> <laughs> will you, Dory? <laughs> um, yeah. Um, now yeah. that you bring it up. <laughs> yeah. So there's a whole section in my book, and I'm actually writing an article right now um, for HBR as well that will outline some of these questions. But it's the idea of really coming in with a, a spirit of inquiry and not just focusing on what you need to get, but what you can give. And inquiry and curiosity are so powerful. It's more about learning about the other individual. So one simple way to think about questions, I could give you a list right now, but <laughs> at the risk of uh, overlisting, um, I just want to share, like, think about what you would like to be asked. And don't be afraid of deeper questions either. There was another study that I cited in my book that says deeper questions actually lead to better connections and that we underestimate when we meet strangers how much those deeper connections can really build those relationships and are enjoyable. So I give these options, like instead of saying like, what do you do? Talk about like, what do they most enjoy? What energizes them? What pieces of work give them the most joy? Instead of where are you from? Ask about all of the different places they've lived or aspects or different locations that have contributed to their lives and careers. Um, there's so many cool, neat questions we can ask that will build connectivity. That's terrific. We are here with Christy Hunter R. Scott. She's the author of a new book. It's called Begin Boldly. You can get it. You can, of course, you can get it in booky kind of places, but you can also get it and learn more at her website. It's christyhunterrscott.com. And if you're enjoying this conversation, it happens every Thursday at noon Eastern. We interview different guests for Newsweek's interview show, Better. I'm Dory Clark, and you can tune in. If you go to my website, it's doryclark.com. You can sign up, download a free self-assessment, and you will join the email list and get reminders for great conversations like this. We want to say hi to some of our amazing friends. Anna's joining from St. Albert, Canada. Canada. Celeste is in South Africa. Kate's in New York. Zalima's back from Mexico. Renee is in Trinidad and Tobago. We have um, Asad uh, Juman in Bangladesh. Wolf is joining, and I'm not sure from where, but I'm gonna I'm gonna take a wild guess and say Germany. <laughs> we have RK from Gujarat. Nahid is in Germany. Luis Carlos is in Mexico. Uh, Sushma is in India. And Sushma had a great question, Christy, that I want to put up on the screen. She says, how do you convince other people to support you when you're taking a risk, but it's a little uncertain and there's, there's no proof yet. So, you know, the other people, you know, everybody's a cynic, right? They, they might be like, oh, can she really do it? How can you actually get others on your side during this liminal phase where you have not yet proven to the world that you actually can do the thing that you think you can? What would you say? So the definition of risk is exactly that. You're not going to have proof and you could fail. <laughs> so really the people that are going to support you need to be those that are willing to also face the outcome of failure with you and understand that risk taking is not about minimizing or avoiding failure. It's about having the tools to deal with it. So it's, it's, it's not always convincing people. It's about finding those right people. So that's kind of a difficult aspect. But one thing I talk about in the book is like surround yourself by successful risk takers and build connections with them because they are going to be phenomenal success advisors in that support network and you'll be closer to where the risks happen. So I definitely look at that aspect in terms of convincing others. There's certain language that you can just use. Like, I believe in my capability to figure this out, irrespective of the outcome. Will you help me think through that end game plan? Those things are really, really great. 
Yeah, that's terrific. We're here with Christy Hunter, R. Scott, author of Begin Boldly. And a great question came in from our friend Kuzehan in the D.C. suburbs. Kuzehan wants to know, Christy, what's your approach to embracing uncertainty and getting over the feelings associated with it? Obviously, this can pr provoke a bit of anxiety for some people. How can we push through that? Yeah, I am. Um, it, it is um, nerve wracking. It is you will feel fear. And I think the thing is that recognizing that those emotions are normal is really important. So it's not about removing fear, removing angst or removing nerves. It's about how do you make progress in spite and in face of those emotions. So when you feel them, it's about recognizing this is natural, but what are the tools to move forward? So I'm going to give you just a couple examples because there's lots around how I do that. One thing for me when I'm facing uncertainty is I have that inner critic, like so many of us that do, that says like, you know, what are you doing? Who are you to do this? You know, what if they think this? There, there may be all of these different voices in my head. And that actually happened to me, Jory, when I first launched my business for my first year. I had no website, no email, no business card. And I was doing everything by referrals. And I was like, well, the point of all of those things is to get business. And I have business. But then I had to have a serious talk with myself and say, one, what type of impact do I want to have? Do I want it to be one client by one client? And by the time I die, my little ripple effect is this. Or do I want broader? Do I want to get these tools into the hands of more people? And once I was honest about that, then I had to be honest about, well, why am I not putting myself out there? Is it really because I have work or is it because of fear of uncertainty and fear of failure? And it was the latter. So I had to face those emotions. But the things that kept me on the route, one is a clear and defined motivation. Define a motivation that matters. What is your why? For me, I knew I wanted to help people build bold and brilliant careers and have a method for risk taking. And to do that as bold leaders and organizations, look at inclusion, look at individuals. And every time I get up and I think, oh, I hear that inner critic. I revert to my motivation and that motivation maintains momentum. So that's one tactic um, that I really, really think is useful. And there's a few others in there in terms of reimagining uncertainty. But the, the reality is we face uncertainty every day. I say we get in our car and we face uncertainty, but we don't think about it that way. And when we get in our car to drive, we've probably had driver's ed. We've got um, a guide. We've got an emergency number if we have a flat. We might have GPS on, um, on our phones. Risk-taking is no different. Sometimes the reason why uncertainty and risk-taking is so, um, elicits so much fear and emotion and resistance is because we don't have a method to approach that. And that's really what the book is. That's terrific. I'm Dory Clark. This is Newsweek's weekly interview show, Better. We're here with Christy Hunter, R. Scott, author of the new book, Begin Boldly. We want to say hi to Cynthia joining us from Los Angeles. We've got Adnan in Turkey. We've got Subrata from India. Jeanette's in Chile. Ellie is in London. Natasha's in Brazil. And Maureen is in Ocean Grove, New Jersey. Hello, everyone. And we're so glad you're here. Now, a great question came in, Christy. You obviously were just mentioning that you studied um, women's studies. And so a question came in from Anna um, talking about uh, privilege in all of this. She says, taking risks is a privilege that not every woman has. Uh, you know, certainly some people who are, uh, have more economic uncertainty, it may feel harder to do it. Um, how can we transform, invoke, and provoke that right in this generation? And of course, um, right here, right now, for people who feel like they just may not be in a position to take any risks. Is that accurate? Is that true? How should we think that through? Yeah, I'm really glad you picked up on that story because I saw um, Anna's question come up on the on the screen, and I think the discussion of privilege um, could take another five hours. But um, I'm going to just kind of hit the tip of the iceberg here, which is we all are able to risk, and it does not mean we are all in the same position that we're all going to face the same amount of backlash for risk gone wrong. Um, and that's part of the reason I wrote the book because the reality is women face more backlash for risk gone wrong. And those that are in an underrepresented position, particularly from a race and ethnicity perspective, may also face those repercussions. And we need to have honest discussions around that. I want real talk. I don't want to say, oh, go out and be bold and you can do anything you want to. No, I want to say when things go wrong, and they may, 
And these are the repercussions you are going to face. Here is how we deal with them. And so one piece that I talk about a lot in my book is going back to that support, that safety net, those success advisors, those people, that is even more important when you feel like you are not coming from a position of privilege per se. The other thing I will say is that a lot of people hold back from risk taking because we come up with these kind of excuses like I don't have enough financial support right now or family support or all of these other things. But you can start taking courageous acts on a small scale right now. And what I talk about in the book is that we often overestimate the impact of large risks. So, you know, moving country, leaving our jobs, but we underestimate the impact of these incremental courageous acts and how those compound over time to really build that brilliant life. So don't underestimate those small acts. Start small and then scale and build your support network irrespective of where you sit in this world. Love that. Thank you. I'm Dory Clark. We're here with Newsweek's weekly interview show, Better. And today we're talking to author Christy Hunter R. Scott. We want to say hi to Priscilla, who's in Brazil. We've got Miriam in Malawi. We've got Masood in Karachi and Alice in Yorkshire, UK. We're glad that all of you joined. And a great question came in from Berkeley, uh, and uh, it is from Alicia. And she wants to know, Christy, how do you distinguish intuition and discernment telling you not to do something Versus it's just fear holding you back. If, if you have sort of a queasy feeling about trying something, should we push through it or not? How do we tell the difference? Yeah. Um, so that's part of why I designed the model at the front. So um, one way we have to do when we're assessing whether to take a risk, because you're absolutely right. When I said risk, reward, refine, repeat, that first step is risk. But we need to know, are we going to take this risk or not? And so I share this moves framework. So it's based on the concept of bold moves. It's an acronym, so it's easy to remember. You assess your motivation. And if you don't have a motivation that matters, you need to think about whether this risk is really worth it. Because sometimes we'll look, particularly in this world of social media and comparisons, we'll look at so many different things. And if it's this extrinsic, arbitrary, doesn't matter motivation, question whether that risk is worth it. Then I say, look at the opportunity and the opportunity cost. So we often say, if I take this risk, this could be the result. I really want you to frame it as an opportunity, but face what the trade-offs are as well. We need to do that up front. Um, the next is, mo um, uh, sorry, what is it? I, I moved, so I was just saying, yeah, the next is vision. Um, I'm going back to motivation. I'm like, motivation moves. What am I? So yeah, m motivation, opportunity, opportunity cost, your vision we, the way that our brains are wired, we're more likely to think about worst case scenario outcomes rather than best case scenario outcomes. So I want you to think about the best case scenario outcome if this risk goes well. What are you doing? Who are you talking with? What does your life and your career look like so that we, we counteract our cognitive tendencies? Then come up with your end game plan. What am I going to do if this does, goes well? What am I going to do if it doesn't? And then again, the support. So that is really how you assess whether or not to take a risk. And that framework can really help you assess this gut feeling or is it fear? Really helpful. Thank you. We're here with Christy Hunter R. Scott. She's the author of a new book called Begin Boldly. We want to say hi to Daniel, who's tuning in from Nigeria. We've got Khaled from Libya. We've got Caroline in Calgary, Abtamu from uh, Abhabtamu from Ethiopia, Patricia in Albany, and Constance in San Diego. Thank you for tuning in. If you're enjoying the conversation, hit the like and share button so that your friends can benefit from it as well. And we have time, Christy, for I think one more question from Adila. And Adila wants to know, how do you identify a successful risk taker? I mean, obviously, we've, we've been talking about the fact that if you take a risk, not everything works out. So judging them by their success metrics of did it work seems inappropriate. What does success actually look like? Yeah, I love to hone in on those people that have made moves and things have gone wrong and they've recalibrated and built something even greater and they've moved even further than they would have without that. And I've just been on some interesting discussions recently around this kind of book tour. And I've just heard such amazing stories of people and those learnings. So seek out people that are pushing boundaries enough that you know of their failures as well, because I think that that is so, so critical um, but then also, I hate to say it, but it's kind of intangible. Like when you meet someone bold, when you know that they're pushing boundaries, pushing the envelope, you, you know, just the stories they tell, their narrative. And so 
finding them also means meeting people and asking them questions. Like one of the questions going back to curiosity and inquiry that I tell people to ask in conversation is like, when, when did you fail? What was the outcome? What have you done with it? Tell me the boldest thing you've done in your career. Like pull that out in conversations and you'll find them. That's fantastic. This is Dory Clark here with Newsweek's weekly interview show, Better. We've been talking with author Christy Hunter R. Scott. You can learn more about her at her website. It's christyhunterrscott.com. The new book is Begin Boldly. Christy, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Dory. And thank you so much to everyone on the line. It's so amazing to see such a global audience and so many questions. And if you have any other questions and you want to contact me directly via my website, please do. And anyone that's on the line, I mean, I just wanted to say a big thank you to Dory because you and your work has truly influenced my career and, and my bold moves. It really was your book, Entrepreneurial You and Your Insights, really set the foundation for the career I have today. So thank you, Dory. That is really kind. Thank you so much, Christy. And thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you next Thursday at 12 Eastern, 9 Pacific, 5 o'clock in London. Until next time.